Okay. If you remember, we were looking at this business of uh, taking a, a small elemental piece of some widget made of some material and subject to some kind of loading which would result in stresses that can look uh, all kinds of different ways. Um, I'll just, I gotta pick something and draw something, so I'll just pick that and draw that. Uh, also, induced stresses are certainly possible and common. And the question was, what if without changing the loadings, we change the angle of the element? What if instead of looking at some nice orthogonal thing where the element is lined up with the X and lined up with the Y, what if we just sort of turn our head sideways a little bit and then see what happens? Because these are all due to forces and when we change the angle uh, on the coordinate system, it changes the components of the forces even if the forces don't change. So we're now looking at the, the possibility of doing just that kind of thing, making some observational change to some new angle and seeing then if that doesn't change are observed stresses. Certainly wouldn't do that. And how they're going to change depends upon what the stresses were, how big they were, what sign they had originally, um, and what the other angle is. So we're, we can get all kinds of possibilities here. So we got it down to the point where we had uh, three equations, each of them containing these simple quantities. So the, the book doesn't do it this way. I find it a lot more convenient to do it this way. This term appears in, in the, the equation, so it's kind of nice to calculate it separately, calculate it ahead of time. Uh, this term also appears, I named it sigma diff because instead of like the sigma average, it's the difference in the two divided by two. So just as a matter of convenience, I, I separately calculate those. Then we had these three equations, not in any particular order other than uh, we typically start with uh, X's and then move, move on from there. And these two uh, things we just calculated. And then the angle at which we're making our new observations appears as well. So uh, with these little things pre-calculated, the, the equations are pretty simple, pretty straightforward, clean. You can imagine how easy this type of thing would be to do to, to uh, write uh, some kind of applet or do it on a spreadsheet. And have these things uh, cranked out for you. And if you go online, you'll find literally hundreds, if not thousands, of applets available to do just this for you. So, uh, only write your own if you're a glutton for that type of punishment. So then we have the three equations. Make sure you get all the plus signs right, all the minus signs right, all the sines and cosines right, because even though there's a ton of these apps on the web, 
if you don't have access to the web during tests. So they're not that difficult. Nothing they can't handle. All right. Minus, minus on that one. Minus, plus. All right, looks okay. All right, so um, uh, here's one of the things that's, that's very important with all of this. There is an angle that I'll call, or we call in this business, theta p for principle. P stands for principle because at that angle something very important happens and that angle can be found from from the, some of the simple uh, uh, stresses that we found so just taking tau uh, xy over sigma, I'm sorry, not sigma average, sigma dip. Get all screwed up. The minus signs aren't right. Sigma dip. So very easy to calculate that angle. At that angle, whatever it happens to be, something very important happens. So here's our original direction. Now at some observational angle we call theta p that is very particular to the input values there. We have we have our new remember our uh, new observational direction if you want to call it that. So here's our our new coordinate system transform. In fact, these are called the transformed stresses. No change in loading, no change in material, no change in any of the geometry that went into this. It's simply uh, you're tilting your head sideways, looking at things a little bit differently. At this particular angle, we get the maximum stresses, normal stresses possible. They could be uh, on the other face. It's possible, but uh, you just have to check and see uh, what happens when you put theta p in there. There's actually two angles, of course, because there's 90 degrees here that's possible. And on the other face, we get the minimum. They might be positive. They might be negative. It just means we're at a min and a max. I have to draw something, so I'll draw them in that direction. And at that principal angle, there are no shear stresses in that direction. So if you have a material that uh, you're worried about it being in, in, in uh, uh, failing due to stress and you can change the direction of the material whether it's wood which has a very definite grain direction to it or um, uh, carbon fiber which is actually a material with 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 uh, threads moving in a certain direction you can accommodate uh, the this this uh, characteristic that at this angle there's no shear stress seen. maximum Normal and uh, normal stresses, but no shear stresses. So that could be uh, uh, something you could advantageously take uh, into account. Now, one way to to pay close attention to what this is is to draw what we call more circle, and that's where I finished on Tuesday. There's, n uh, there's not really anything you can do with the circle that you can't do with the equations anyway. I find the circle uh, a, a little bit confusing for certain things that it's a lot easier to do just by putting in the equations and calculating. Uh, but it can help 
in some ways. Um, I've also found when drawing Mohr's circle, uh, it, it, its coordinates and size depend upon these, these values of the sigma x's and the tau xy's, of course. Uh, I find it a lot more advantageous drawing the circle to draw the circle first and then put in the different coordinates that you have uh, based on these values. It just makes for a better drawing. It's, a, it's really hard, I think, to draw on the axes, plot the points, and then draw a decent circle to those points. It's just a lot easier drawing it to do it the other way around. The circle is drawn on coordinates where the x-axis is simply sigma x. Oh, sorry, sorry, not sigma x, just sigma in general. Because we have sigma x, we have sigma y, we have average and diff, <coughs> we also have max and min, so just sigma in general. Now the y-axis can appear anywhere depending on exactly what the values are. And it's very easy to come up with examples that put the y-axis in all kinds of different places. Can be entirely to the left of the circle, could be entirely to the right, could go through the circle somewhere. So I have to draw something, so I'll draw it right there. It depends on what the numbers are in the problem what the actual loadings are that, that make up all of these different things. The center of the circle is at sigma average, the little piece thing you had calculated there. The radius of the circle is at the square root of sigma diff squared plus tau xy squared, which you get from the original loading and the original coordinate direction, typically the, the straight xy coordinate direction. So that's a r and the center as is at sigma average. So if you're uh, if you're doing this on graph paper and have a compass or something, that's stuff that's very easy to draw. Uh, figure out where sigma average is, put the compass there, give it a, a spread of whatever is equivalent to R, and then draw your circle and you've got it. The reason it's helpful is this value right here is, well, that's as far as we can go on the normal stress axis. That is the value for sigma max. This other one, as far left as we can go on the circle, is sigma min. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even tell you what the x, or the y-axis is. The y-axis is minus tau up plus tau down, the shear stress. The reason the minus goes up is so that any angles that we're going to get on this drawing are in the same direction as the angles for our element. If we did plus tau up, then a counterclockwise angle here would be a clockwise angle here, and it gets even more confusing. So uh, that means that these extremes and notice, since the circle is always right on the x-axis, these two extremes have the same magnitude. And it's the magnitude of the shear that's our greatest concern. These are tau max. 
So from uh, a simple drawing of using these points, these coordinates, these equations to plot this circle, we can get uh, a very quick idea of what the maximum possible stresses are and what the minimum and the maximum shear stresses are. Uh, what's not here yet on this is where this direction of the principal stresses is. This is called, by the way, the principal plane. So what we don't have here yet is just what that angle is. We now already know what the maximum and minimum stresses are. We don't know where they occur yet. So to find that, well, you can either just calculate it straight away, which is virtually foolproof if you're careful with your calculator, or you can plot it on here. You can plot the point wherever it might be. It could be anywhere on the circle. Plot the point, sigma x tau xy. When you plot that point, it gives you the angle not theta p, gives you the angle 2 theta p. All these equations have 2 theta in them. All those equations together led to this circle. So that's why the circle has the equation 2 theta p. And notice they're in the same direction. So that's why we put the minus tau going up. It's not just, a, not just to piss you off, but uh, it has a particular purpose to it. All right, there also happens to be another particular angle at some angle that we call theta s. I think it stands for secondary. At some angle theta s that we find in much the same way. Gotta make sure I get the minus signs right. Minus sigma diff over tau x, y. So it's negative inverse of the tangent of the other angle. And um, these two angles, theta s and theta p, are 45 degrees apart. We get a different but just as important direction. So there's our original direction. Let's say our theta s gives us an element that way. Now, notice uh, in the in the drawing there there uh, 45 degree or. I guess you can't notice it, but they would be 45 degrees apart, which puts them 90 degrees apart on the circle. At that point, we get stresses that are, the normal stresses are all the same on all faces. And it's sigma average on all faces. And the shear stresses are the maximum they can be. So this becomes an angle of interest just as much as the other one. Because now we, if we have something that's, that's particularly weak to shear, as wood can be. Wood has a definite grain to it, as you know. because of the growth rings. Those growth rings are very strong in shear 
across the grain. Along the grain, they're very weak and sheer because the growth rings are alternating layers of hardwood and softwood. The hardwood's the darker thing that we usually call the ring. The softer is the uh, material that's in between each ring. And you know that there's pretty much a, a, a ring every year as they grow. And they go through different cycles in the, in the growth season, causing different cycles, if you will, in the material itself. These layers are very weak in shear. That's why when you build a deck and you put some wood joists, you do not buy wood. I don't know if you could even, you'd have to go have a custom cut. Well, it couldn't do it, it wouldn't work. But there wouldn't be any wood available where the uh, growth rings are like that because you put a deck on that, you stand on that, you cause trans transverse shear, that uh, wood joist is just gonna go, go right through. Uh, trees don't grow big enough to even come up with boards like that because um, you'd have to look at the tree with its growth rings, you'd have to have a board that's cut across there and there aren't many eight foot in diameter boards to give you, I mean trees to give you an eight foot board. Plus you'd only, well you get one here, but you could stack them all the way down the tree, I guess, if you wanted those. But uh, they don't even come like that. The trees don't even produce many like that. Um, that's, that's God telling us he wants us to have a nice deck. That's what that is. There's no other explanation for it. So anyway, we have these principal directions that give us the maximum strains. The uh, circle helps us know uh, just what those are as well. And uh, uh, again, there's nothing you can do with the circle. You can't do with the equations themselves. So if you find the circle uh, confusing, relax. Uh, but you've got to have seen it. If I sent you out of here to RPI and you said, I've never heard of the Mohr Circle, we'd never transfer another student to that school. Understandably. Um, however, Colin and Jake, you love freehanding circles. You know how to do it. You're, you're all excited about this. Do we? Uh, so it's the uh, P and the S are 45 degrees apart, right? It doesn't have to go in those directions, right? It could be like theta P goes that way and then you go another 45, and that gives you theta S. Yeah, that's the, just, uh, any, remember, any time you do the tangent, you get two values for it that are 45 degrees apart. Two, you, this, this ratio would give you two values for theta P, 45 degrees apart. You put, you could put each of those into the equation to see which one of them is giving you theta max, uh, sigma max, which one of them is giving you say, sigma min, and uh, then you you do the same thing for here because it could be that theta ma uh, sigma max isn't on this face; it's on this face over here, and you wouldn't know just simply from calculating a theta p. You need to calculate both of them. You can stick them into the equation, or you can draw your Mohr circle here. Um, the book calls this point A. It could be that point A is over here, so that theta p back to the x-axis, positive x direction, is uh, uh, much longer. In fact, it would be 90 degrees longer. So, well, it's time to do a couple problems and run through these. Is there a place on that circle for the the yeah, theta, theta S is 45 degrees from this, so it's 90 degrees from that. Oh, I already put the R kind of there. Do you normally draw that in or not really? Pardon me? Do you normally draw that in or not really? Uh, not typically. In fact, I think in the book, where the book has a, a, a like a page and a half where they summarize the circle. And they say, uh, Calculate theta p and theta s, 
No, it's, it's calculate theta p shown in the figure such and such. Calculate theta as not shown. Uh, it, it, you can imagine it can clog this up pretty quickly. Because not only do you have those lines, you've got to have the angles drawn, the directions drawn, all the different things. It, it gets pretty crowded, pretty, pretty clogged up. All right, so let's clear a little board space and put up a sample problem and run through it. Oh, let me not forget to put down. Uh, notice that this is the radius of the circle, so this is also then tau max itself, the magnitude of tau max. Square root plus and minus, and you got a plus and minus, <coughs> just like you'd expect and could use. All right, so here's some problem. We, 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 we're given some, some gadget, loaded somehow, we calculate the loads, uh, calculate the stresses at a particular point, and we come up with something like this as a result. Uh, sigma x of 50 megapascals. Sigma y, 10 megapascals in that direction, and a and a shear stress. of 40 megapascals like that. All right, before you get going on these, let's make sure we remember the directions and our sign conventions for these. Because if you don't have the sign convention right, the equations are all going to be backwards. Sigma x is positive 50. And we're pretty used to that because it's in tension. Uh, the sigma y is in compression, so it's a minus. What about tau xy? One a little bit harder to remember. That's also positive. This is our positive convention. All right, so we've got everything we need. We can now calculate the uh, the principal directions and the principal stresses. You don't have to, but I find it a lot easier because you're going to need them in several places to calculate sigma average and sigma diff separately. Frank, you're expecting some pretty good weather today? Good. It looks pretty sporty. Pat, you look like you just barely got out of bed. I think I have some leftover stuff for you. And were either of you guys going to go to RPI, you think? Okay. Because they're on a transfer day. All schools do. It's just I have to get a note about RPI. Yeah, even as alumni, I got it because there's my graduation year. Wow, you guys are hardly born then. That sucks. Sucks for you. I'll tell them immature you are. Some of you guys aren't even shaving yet. Right, Dewey? Look at all these baby faced little boys. I 
<laughs> why are you? That's what I'll be nice to do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, why would I? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You guys think shaving? I used to be a bike racer. I shaved a lot more than you guys have ever shaved. Alright, very straightforward, plug and chug, the, the student's favorite type problem. Just go into autopilot, finally saying, oh man, I'm glad I got this $120 calculator finally. It really is coming into use here. In fact, I'll bet you that somebody's got uh, more circle equations already put in. Okay, I'm just checking on your circle. I'm checking your circle. Jay, go back and see your circle. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, shit. Oh. Come on. Okay. Golly. What kind of grade would you give him to check on the freaking sketch if you were me? Can't even draw a circle. Come on. We got a guy. So. That tells me technical freehand sketching made things worse for you. Let's see your sir. Not too bad. Brandon, you had years practicing with me. That's okay. You at least recognize that. Not too bad. Not too bad, Bobby. Let me see your circle. Not too bad. It's okay to draw an egg. It's almost Easter, right? That's what you're thinking. Do be amazing. Best one in here. What are we finding? <laughs> uh, we're finding out how to, who draws the best circle, and it's you. We're finding a couple things we need. Uh, we need to know at what angle these maximum stresses occur. So that's uh, that's more than anything what we need. Uh, we can do this on off angles, but I didn't give you one in this problem. It's, it's common in some of these problems to say uh, at what at a certain angle, what are the stresses? But for this one, I want to find the principal stresses. It's called finding the principal planes. And then find the stresses in those planes, in that direction. Theta P and theta S should be 45 degrees apart. two angles really. Uh, the tangent repeats itself every 45 degrees, which in our book is 90 because that's the shape of our cubes. Where's the maximum stress in the water? It's 
the other side of the circle. So it would be sigma average minus R. Maximum stress, normal stress is sigma average plus R. The other side would be sigma average minus R. And it may be on the other side of the y-axis. It might not be. We don't know where the y-axis is until we, we actually plot everything. But that'll be all taken care of if you calculate these. So let's see. Get down the values we need. Sigma average, which remember is the center of the circle, and the location and the uh, the stress that goes with the maximum shear stress is sigma angstrom is 20. Now, remember these, these sigma average and sigma diff little things you won't find in the book. I just think it makes things an awful lot easier. Uh, if you don't want to use them, don't. You're grown up, sort of. Um, so that's what? That's 30. That itself doesn't have any particular value to us in the problem other than it repeats a lot and we need to calculate them. center of the circle. So I guess we can call that C. We've already drawn the circle, so um, we 
know that it's at 20 megapascals. And a distance plus 50 and minus 50 is the radius, so that makes this plus 50, that's 70. That is sigma max. 20, the center, minus the radius is minus 30. <coughs> sigma min, and so we know that our x-axis goes uh, right about here. And on that, we plot uh, tau with uh, the plus going down. And so now we've got uh, some of our major pieces now. That's uh, obviously 50. That's the maximum shear. And to find out where our problem lies on this circle, we have to plot uh, point sigma x, which is plus 50, uh, right about here. It should automatically fall on the circle because the circle is made up of these very values. So this should automatically be the point um, 50 and 40. And then that gives us Of you. Uh, that angle, if you calculate it, which you can do now because you, you know the coordinates of it, you can find out the tangent of this point from this center, that angle should be whatever the double of that is. I think it's 53, 3, 3, 4 or something, which is, is just what it comes out to be. And then we can draw our principal angle. So at some angle, half that, which we have, the 26.6, we have our new coordinate direction. Um, and what falls on that element in that direction? The maximum stress, which we know to be 70, and it's the first direction we hit in that, so we know it's the x phase. Actually, we have those values. Where to pull it? 70, right there. We know on the other face is the minimum, and notice that's 90 degrees away from here, which on the circle where we double everything is 180 degrees. So we've gone 180 degrees around to the max minimum. We know it's negative here. It isn't in every problem. It is in this one. So the compressive stresses have increased in this direction, as have the tensile stresses. Because now the forces causing the shear are combined in these directions, because it's just a, essentially an addition of force vectors. And uh, what about the, the other angle, theta s? 45 degrees from this angle is our other element direction.
and on it are the average stresses on each face, which we know to be positive because our center is at plus 20. It's not necessarily very helpful to draw these on both on the same diagram other than it does illustrate again that they're 45 degrees apart. And the stresses, the shear stresses. Our maximum shear stress is 50. Plus 50 because uh, they're on that side of the y-axis. It's not uncommon to combine these drawings where we draw uh, the principal direction looks something like that with the principal stresses. And then draw uh, that face would be the easiest one. That's that's got twenty. And a shear of fifty. Put them into one. That's a little cleaner drawing and shows the two things of importance in the in the single drawing. Beautiful, huh? Some of you have no trouble seeing all these angles and all these directions and everything in this circle. Uh, I think it's pretty easy to get confused. I still do after teaching in all these years. Um, but a combination of, of the simple parts of the circle plus the equations and you can get everything you need from it. Okay, so uh, we can keep doing problems, but we only got two minutes left. So uh, on Monday, we'll take it a step farther. Huh? We do? Test on Tuesday already? Wow, that sucks. I hate to be you. Yeah, we do. So, uh, we'll take it a step farther on Monday. We'll do a, a, a quick warm-up problem and then do another step farther. But that step extra stuff we won't put on the test. It's, 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 uh, as long as you get these basics, then the step farther will come just fine.